You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host. And today on our show, we're going to talk about the nonprofit infrastructure, a little bit anyway. The nonprofit infrastructure makes up a variety of organizations that support nonprofits in their efforts to serve society in various ways. We're talking about organizations that help boards. We're talking about organizations that promote accountability, like the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. We're talking about organizations that serve donors and charities in different ways, but don't necessarily provide direct service. These are critical organizations in the success factor of our nonprofits. Without them, nonprofits really couldn't get a lot of their work done really well. And one particular organization we're going to focus on today is probably one that a lot of our listeners never heard of. It's the National Human Services Assembly. And this is a sort of quasi-trade association of organizations that engage in human services. And with me to talk about this particular piece of our infrastructure is its president, Victor Valentine. Victor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Art. Appreciate you having me. And let me say uh, thank you for all the work that you do individually, but also your leadership in providing a platform for folks like me to come on and share. Well, wonderful. Well, Victor, let's get into a little bit about you. Okay. Because, you know, on our show, we always like to talk about our guests, how they got to this particular role that they're in right now. What about their early life sort of led them to working in the nonprofit sector in the first place? Because we know that most people don't grow up thinking I'm going to be a nonprofit executive. <laughs> and many people and from if you were from my background, you wouldn't even have known what a nonprofit was. For that matter. <laughs> Fair so, enough. So, Victor, tell me a little bit about you. How did you get to this role? And what was it about the nonprofit sector in particular that uh, intrigued you enough to to begin working in it? Well, I appreciate the the question. It's an answer that comes early on in life. I came from a family of people who believe service uh, to others was the best path to a happy life. So I'm originally from Philadelphia and, you know, growing up as a young person in the 1980s, we were privy to all types of challenges that young people in an urban setting would face, whether it was through education, whether it was the rising of drugs and crime. And I always believe because of my own personal background that I was always one degree of separation from being caught up in something negative, but I was fortunate to have parents and a support system around me. And so I used to say to myself, there by the grace of God go I, And that made me want to give back. And again, at an early age, I identified public service as the vehicle. Uh, At first, it was more political in nature. I went to school to get a poli sci degree and then ultimately matriculated to get a master's in public administration. But I instead of politics, I decided to dedicate myself to public service. As far as the nonprofit world came, it was my My entry point from moving away from government, where I served on the staff of the former mayor of Baltimore City, to to moving into a role of working in a nonprofit in Baltimore that provided um, services to people who were engaged in the criminal justice system. And that's kind of where I really got my love and desire, because just like a construction worker can see through their efforts as they lay a foundation and then they put up the framing. Um, you're working with people and you can see the changes in their lives. 
you feel like there's a sense of accomplishment. So ultimately through multiple arenas, whether it was in Baltimore City, moving and working in New York City, primarily in the workforce development space and the civil rights advocacy space. It led me to, there comes a point in time when you want to take the things that you've learned, the things you've been fortunate enough to engage in, and you want to take them to scale. So the National Human Services Assembly provides a vehicle now for, because you mentioned very astutely, we are more of a backbone organization for other nonprofit organizations to help them build their capacity to take their services and goods to the communities across America. So being in this role now helps me to kind of bring to bear all of those traits, all of those experiences, all of those supports that I've received over the years and help to shape an agenda to, to help other organizations build capacity to do more. Super. Victor, tell us about the work of the National Human Services Assembly. Sure. Well, the National Human Services Assembly, to your earlier point, is a membership organization. It consists of some of the nation's most active providers in human services, some very well-known and some not so well-known organizations. But we like to say that our members reach practically every community in America and their services range from serving people with disabilities, older adults, youth, workforce development, economic mobility. If it, if it has anything to do with providing needed goods and services to help you know Americans reach the goals and to fulfill the quote unquote American dream, our members are in those places and spaces. And that's also whether it's urban, suburban and or rural. We do this primarily, you know, again, as a backbone organization by helping to support our members through strategy. And we have four strategic pillars in which we do this. The first is we like to support organizational capacity building. We have a group purchasing program called Purchasing Point, which allows nonprofits to pull together uh, to buy goods and services at a significant discount. Because, I, you know, a lot of times when you ask nonprofits what are their biggest issues, many times they'll talk about funding. Well, there's two sides of the of that economic equation. There is how much money you're able to bring into an organization, but then there's also developing efficiencies through your operations to help you save more money towards your mission, which is our tagline. The second way we like to, to support the industry is we, we are a convener. We're a convener of experts, of partners, of supporters, of interested parties, and ultimately the, the people who we're, we're trying to serve around strategies. And one of our main strategies is youth diversion, because we believe that, and we look at youth diversion in multiple ways. Obviously, we need to invest in our young people, and we need to reduce the number of young people who get engaged in the criminal justice system for various reasons. But the other part is that's also an equity strategy. Because as we know, by and large, many of the youth who are engaged in the criminal justice system come from diverse ethnic and racial backgrounds. The third way that we like to support the sector right now, the human services sector in, in particular, as well as many other nonprofits are going through a human resources shortages, the great resignation. We're looking at this as not only a way as jobs start to come back online, um, how are we going to build our organizations in a way and in a manner that allows us to be flexible, adaptable and relevant going forward? But this is also another opportunity to tap into people and populations um, that may not know about the, the great work that human services are doing, but also the economic driver that the companies who do them are. And last but not least, we like to promote best practices for diversifying the human services through leadership. And when I mean leadership, that's at the board and the C-suite levels. We can talk till we're blue in the face about some of the current challenges brought on by COVID, by racial and social unrest, um, by economic downturns. But there are some of the old ways and old issues that are, have never really gone away. And, and we know that many of the organizations who are working in communities are not reflective enough of the communities that they're trying to serve. So that's a little bit of a background about who we are and what we're trying to get done. Victor, what are some of the issues that human services organizations are really facing today? And have those issues changed in your estimation over the last decade or so? OK, so if you're talking in the last decade, as I mentioned, I'll mention two in particular. I think because of the pandemic, I tend to say that it, it's no different than if the world was hit with 
a, a nuclear bomb. So what do I mean by that is that all of us now in some ways are, have had to shelter in place. Our movement has been restricted. We're doing business and building and keeping our relationships going in many different ways. We're doing virtual meetings and our organizations are having to run their business both electronically and virtually. And so we have a, a moment in time where, from a human resources standpoint, people are leaving the industry, have left the industry, but the need is still as great as it's ever been, if not even more so, as organizations that may traditionally have been doing work in workforce development, you now have to pay attention to the mental health component of workers who have been dislocated or whose lives have been turned upside down. And we have to bring more professionals back into our organizations that, one, have a passion and a commitment and a desire for the work. Two, are supported in doing the work beyond the normal ways that we used to support, which is simply providing a space and, and a paycheck. We now have to think in terms of a, creating an ecosystem to develop the talent if we want to attract them. And last but not least, we always have to continue to look at the wages of the people who are, are doing this work. Bottom line is, is that in many cases, those who are doing some of the greatest work in our communities are one degree of separation of needing those services themselves. And we have to change that dynamic, but that's not a new dynamic. Another dynamic that I would say still persists, and I am and, and you are the living, breathing embodiment of diversity in a leadership space when it comes to both the nonprofit, human service, and, and, and philanthropic sectors. We need more people who are bringing more diverse ideas, more diverse thoughts, different type of energy to the table. And so, and you know, and this is now becoming an issue on multiple levels. Funders of organizations are paying closer attention to how is your, your leadership paradigm structured? Are you representative of the communities you're trying to serve? Because if you're not, how can you possibly understand how to meet people where they are and develop the needs and the services that will be culturally competent in order to make a real difference? And so we also need to look at how are we attracting diverse communities to this work? Where are you looking? As an African-American male, are you working in places and spaces trying to talk to men and young women of color who might be associated with an organization like the Urban League or as a young professionals group? Are you working in HBCUs? Are you going to some of our Greek letter organizations? And are you able to develop strategies to attract them? Once you're able to attract them, do you have the, as I mentioned before, the ecosystem within your organizations that are one, ready for change and two, know how to support that change? Because one of the things I like to tell some of my friends is that it's one thing to become the king or queen. It's another thing to stay it and, and to be able to sustain careers within leadership positions. There are just very different needs. I come to the work myself, not as a you know, not as a, a nonprofit leader who happens to be from a diverse background, but I, I am a diverse leader within an organization that comes with me in many ways and that it may not have come in, in other areas for other people. So those are two places that I believe over the last 10 years we still need to address, because if you just simply look out the window, or if you pay attention, we've not we have a road to we still have a road to try. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned Philadelphia and diversity in the nonprofit sector. People ask, well, where did you come from? How did you get in this job, you know, leading a, a piece of our national infrastructure in the nonprofit sector at the Wise Giving Alliance? And I was fortunate to have worked for an organization in Philadelphia that was founded by Black people. <laughs> and <laughs> ultimately, I was able to rise through the ranks, so to speak, and become the national president of Opportunities Industrialization Centers of America, headquartered in Philadelphia. And at, at my age, I was at the time, I was 31 years old wow. and uh, heading this national organization. Now, would I have been given that same opportunity if it were a white-led organization? Probably not, you know, and yet if it hadn't been for that experience, who knows if I would still be in the nonprofit sector or not? 
So, you know, we get these opportunities sometimes because we are part of a tradition of we come from a tradition of black people or diverse people who have an organization, but those organizations are far and few. We've got to get people moving through organizations that are led by white people or people of all sorts of backgrounds and and getting them plugged in. So I'm a rarity. You know, I am just uh, unusual. I call myself a unicorn. In, in, I, I know. I yeah, know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, we're getting getting these opportunities. And that's not to say that all success is less than fortuitous. I mean, there, there's always a break that you got here or there and someone saw you do something and you get an opportunity or something odd happens. And the next thing you know, you're in a role that happens all the time. And I, I don't like it when people say, well, you know, I worked hard and I was able to do this, that and the other thing. And I pulled myself up. Well, you know what? A lot of people are working hard. That's right. It's not always that. It's fortune. It's good fortune sometimes, along with skills and hard work Agreed. that land people into uh, certain situations. So but you make a great point about this need to get more of our people from diverse backgrounds in significant positions in these organizations, especially ones that are serving people of diverse backgrounds. That is so important. I mean, why would you want to be in an organization that doesn't respect what you have to offer in the leadership role? So I think that's what we got to begin facing in our sector. We just, by the way, completed a survey because another thing you mentioned was how donors are thinking about this. And we're going to have some really blockbuster information coming out about how donors think about organizations that are engaging in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're talking about donors across the board, every race, color, religion, age group. And I think the top line is that we're going to see that people do value organizations that are engaging in this work. Not all organizations, not, not every person, but a significant portion of our society will reward organizations that are focused on including people of all backgrounds in the leadership and management of the organizations as well, and who are serving those communities too. In fact, I just saw the Goldman Sachs, the great Goldman Sachs organization, I just saw in their 10 million black women initiative, they have just announced that they're going to give 50 to $250,000 grants to organizations that are led by black women. That's awesome. You know, and I just think that's terrific because it's often those are the folk who have the most difficult times attracting the connections that they need to open doors to get funding. So I think it's so terrific that Goldman and probably other organizations too are looking at how they can support those leaders. So let's get back to you. Now, <laughs> the Human Services Assembly has been around a long time. And I know some of the members, but let's give us a little rundown of some of the organizations that are members and have been been with you for a while. Sure. Well, I mean, a, a little while is is a lot of while. We celebrate our centennial in 2023, so we are 99 years old as we speak. And some of the organizations, I can tell you, you know, they, I'll mention some that might come to mind very easily, and then maybe some that that don't. But we're very happy and proud that we have this collection of human service organizations. So we do have the United Way Worldwide as a member of our organization. We have the Youth Advocate Programs. We have the Community Action Partnership Network. Then there are those that come, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters Program, Girl Scouts, the American Red Cross, the ARC. And then, you know, from a veteran standpoint, Combined Arms, representing the LGBTQ Community Center Link. So we, we have a lot of folks that are associated with this work. And then when you start to think about folks, the other organizations that are providing backbone and leadership, you know, the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance, 
is one of the, the primary and, and more prominent organizations that help us get our, our work done. So, you know, I'm just mentioning a few without going through the whole list. And, and again, those are some of our core partners. But, you know, we have tons and tons. Each one of those organizations are parts, you know, is a part of a much larger network. And so our reach goes beyond our core partners, not just some of their subsidiaries, but into the regions and into the various other organizations that may be a part of. When we decide to distribute information on a regular, it goes out to 8,000 people. So, and that's just our core communication list that doesn't include the ancillary groups that are associated with it. Yeah, that's that's pretty significant work that you're doing. Your membership is indeed vast. Now, talking about diversity, one of the members you mentioned is the United Way Worldwide. And I want to hold up that Angela Williams yes. is the new CEO there. And she represents the first black woman to serve as the CEO of the United Way Worldwide, which I think is just wonderful. It is wonderful. And I hope everybody gets to meet Angela because she is just amazing. She's just wonderful. She's smart. She's a lawyer. She's she's also a minister. Most people don't understand that. She's a minister as well. Her heart is just full of love and joy. And in her head, she's competent. She's able. She is a true leader. And I know that the United Way and your network too is going to really benefit greatly. And our country is going to benefit greatly from Angela's leadership. And and, and kudos to the United Way Worldwide Board for having the the foresight and the, the strength to position uh, Angela for that role. So Agreed. Uh, great kudos to them. I am looking forward to meeting her as well. We've exchanged early communications and I smile because I come from out of in a previous life uh, being at the United Way of New York City, Uh where we also had a a woman of color who who led that organization in Sheena Wright, who I know just recently transitioned into working for the new administration with the mayor's office in New York City. So it's encouraging, it's inspirational, and it's the type of thing that keeps me going to see other folks who are coming from diverse backgrounds who have been who are given the opportunity to to bring a a revised vision. I don't want to say a new one because you want to continue to build on the great work that that folks, regardless of their background, have laid. But there's a revised vision because we have to be more relevant for tomorrow. I, I you know I thank you for providing an opportunity and a platform, being able to totally embrace technology and the way that we communicate each other through social media. You know, we have to bring even more next gen folks who are used to those things on the table. So I'm looking forward to to seeing her in particular, the vision that she rolls out. And um, I've already offered to, to do whatever I can to help support her, whether it's just me as an individual knowing what it feels like to be in the chair or from organization to organization. Victor, so you and I have been doing this work for a long time. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I think I'm probably a a few few years older than you. So maybe I'm your slightly older brother. There it is. But we we have time stamps on on what we have left in this work. and, And we have to begin transitioning to the next generation. And... We want to make sure that people coming into this field have the knowledge and history, and they can also take advantage of what we've learned, and they can ignore some of the stuff we did wrong, right? They can avoid some of the pitfalls that we made. Well said. But what are some of the pieces of advice, for instance, that you would give to a person thinking about entering this field right now, what would you tell them that would be both helpful if they did get in Mm -hmm. and both inspiring to get them maybe over that hump, turning down that big job at the big corporation that might make them much more money to taking a job in a human services organization and maybe not making so much money, but doing something that can really help the lives of people. What would you what would you tell them? 
That's a great question. And like you said, being a big brother, and I do see you as that, I believe you also have to give back and pay it forward. And so I would put a plug in here for mentorship. I think it's very important when you find young folks or emerging leaders who are interested in public service or through nonprofit or even government, that you immediately put your arm around them and you do exactly what you're asking me. What are some ways that you can do that? I think what I, I normally tell the young people that I'm fortunate enough to, to speak with is money is important. And you don't have an organization and you don't, you're not able to do many things in the world that we live in without money. But if you were using your analogy of looking at a big salary, let's just say someone is coming to you and offering you a much larger salary to work in a for-profit space versus a nonprofit one. The only way that you're able to realize that gain is being there all 12 months. So whatever number is on the offer letter, you do not realize it until the end of that year. Then you can say, I earned that. And there are many obstacles in the way between now and then, especially if you're not feeling that your purpose, that your skills, that your energy are being utilized to their fullest. Now, conversely, if you're looking at the nonprofit sector, you're probably going to be able to attach yourself to something that means something to you personally. And there might be a level of fulfillment associated with your work. So, you know, I'll just use a real number. There's a $150,000 salary in front of you from the corporate, but then there's a $75,000 one at the nonprofit. If you do not make it out of your 90 days at the corporate... <laughs> You do not get the 150, but because you are fulfilled and there is a there is a phrase that says doing good is good business. You'll be able to sleep at night and you'll be more motivated to get up when it gets very difficult, because the, the most important thing, particularly working in a nonprofit, is you better understand your why. Why did I come here in the first place? Why do I continue to come? What is it that I want to see happen as a positive community level impact or a change or a systems, new systems design that can remove barriers so people can get access to it? Better know your why. And if you're committed to yourself, understand your purpose and know your why, then you can remain a little laser-like focused on, on the job at hand when things will inevitably get very, very tough. We're in a human business. And so there comes with that, not just the, the roles, responsibilities, and tasks, but there is the emotional intelligence that you have to have because we are sharing the burden with other people for the things that they may happen to be going through. And it's important to understand whether you're doing direct service or you're working in an organization like mine where you're bringing together experts and leaders to talk about how to provide better services. You better understand your why. Yeah. Well, now that we have sort of uh, dissuaded people from entering <laughs> the corporate world. I'm a practical in favor person. <laughs> of the stuff we do. I, I do want to just acknowledge that there's a lot that can be done to by folk in the corporate world yes. to support human services. And we want to make sure that young people in the corporate world realize that they can have an impact from wherever they're standing. You just have to decide to do it. And I know it may feel harder early in your career because you have so many other obstacles. You have so many other responsibilities. You're learning. You're, you're connected to people who you report to and you have family obligations. And there are lots of reasons why you might not volunteer to do things early on, or you might not have as much money to give away as you will later on in your life. But there are all sorts of ways to have an impact. And if you're creative you can find ways to make a difference wherever you stand, whoever you're standing with in your life. So I want to just hold that up too and make sure that young people, in fact, everyone understands that they can have an impact. 
Now, these human services organizations are the ones that really are on the front line. You know, you're feeding people, you're clothing people, you're providing homes for people who are homeless. You're making sure that kids have what they need to go to school. You are taking care of them when it's time for them to have recreation moments. Mm -hmm. You're helping their parents so that they can do a better job parenting. You're dealing with kids who don't have parents. You're helping people transition from school to work. All of these things are human services that I would frankly say more people are needing as our world becomes increasingly complex. And so here is, for anyone interested in making an impact, a clear path to doing that. You know, spending any amount of your time or your career working in human services will give you that immediate impact that you may want to have on the lives of other people. You know, hard stop on that because yep. that's just a pure and simple fact. And you're going to work in these organizations and they're going to be short of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've never worked in a, a nonprofit that had everything it needed to get the, get the job done. But through creativity, through enterprise, through collaboration, and through hard work and faith, really, yes. that you can do this work, things get done. And I can remember many times in my early career leading OIC that we didn't have enough money on Monday to make the payroll on Friday. I know this dynamic, yes. <laughs> okay. We didn't have the money Monday to make the payroll on Friday. So you get on the phone yep. and you start calling people. Can we get this in early? That's right. Where's the check? I know you promised it. I need it right now. When do we? When can we get it to you? When can you get it to me? You call your banker friends. That's right. Can we get a short-term loan to make it through this week? And I've never had a situation where the money didn't come. It always got there. And, you know, so some of this is faith. When we talk about human services organizations and businesses together, the two don't even match. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we've been saying this for a long you know, time. Because, because you have a business and you have this marketplace where you can go to raise money, particularly a business that's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, they can raise capital. They can do all sorts of things that they need. But if you're a nonprofit, business plans are great, but they don't quite work because you're leveraging all kinds of other things just to make it happen. That's right. And that kind of career is one that I think can carry a person in any field because they know how to make it work, how to make things happen, how to make something out of nothing. And at the same time, stay focused really on the mission of improving lives and improving our society. So Hey, well, you know, stay. if you're up for a challenge, <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> and if you're up for making a difference, this is where you should be. Jump in. <laughs> hey, am I preaching? You are, and, and I am the Am I preaching for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we're getting to the end of it, but I want to give you just an opportunity to glance into the future a little bit and tell us what you see as far as the ability of human services organizations to meet the need that continues to grow in our society for the services they provide. What are you seeing now, five, seven, 10 years from now, after we, some of us begin to move off the scene, what, what will we be seeing in our society? Well, I, I'm going to be a little aspirational and I'll tell you what I hope we see, okay. because it is absolutely a time where, of transition it's a time of uncertainty. You know, many of the ways that we have operated in the past will not be the ways that we need to operate going into the future. And I think we're going to be able to, to do more in the way of getting more goods and services out faster through the leaning on technology, utilizing some of that creativity that you were talking about, bringing people on who are a lot more creative in the ways that we do business. I talk about fundraising 
and how we were used to having golf tournaments and annual galas. And, and so now all of a sudden we're calling events expanded Zoom meetings. Well, how do you show up in a way where you're able to convince people and touch people through a different medium? So I think that, you know, many of our organizations are going to find ways to be more efficient, even in the way they do business. We're coming out of a time where brick and mortar and building monuments to organizations is probably going by the wayside. That if you're, the heart of your house might be virtual, you can do things more electronically. The transactional parts of a nonprofit can be done a little bit more centrally and, and more efficiently that way so that you can free up more of your resources for getting more of the goods and services into the communities. And I think, and this is what I'm truly hoping is that a lot of times when we're thinking in human services, we look at the quote unquote client, customer, community as an external one. But we have to also look at it internally, because if you're not developing your talent internally, then you're going to have a brain drain. You're going to have a talent drain. So I'm thinking that the human services sector is going to start repositioning, and I'm hopeful repositioning resources towards building its its bench strength so that when we do bring folks in who may not be ready for the top spots, there is a, a ladder or a lattice that has areas for development where they can take advantage of. There's an investment in them so that they will stay long term and sustain careers. That is my hope for the industry in, in a few ways. And then the biggest, the bigger goal is We understand what many of the challenges are that people are facing day to day, and our children and maybe our children's children may not have to face those things if we really commit ourselves less to the I and the people and to the it. What is it that we want to see done versus where do I see myself? And I think when we commit ourselves to that, then we get past the personalities, we get past the politics, we get past some of the issues and challenges that come with just interacting amongst each other. And then we can really focus on, here is the impact, the positive impact we want to see in our community. Here's where we believe we can leverage it. And here's the game plan. Let's get to it. Victor, I can't uh, agree with you more. I just want to thank you for joining me and to our guests You've been listening to Victor Valentine, who is the president and CEO of the National Human Services Assembly. And it's been like just two brothers talking. (laughs) It's been great. And to our guests and and to our listeners, I just want to thank you for tuning in. You may be watching this on YouTube or you might just be listening on one of the major podcast platforms that we're, we're on all of them. In case you want to subscribe, I hope you will. And if you want to watch these on YouTube, you can do that as well. Just subscribe to the BBB Wise Giving Alliance channel on YouTube and you can see them. And if you want to support our podcast, you can also go to give.org and make a donation to the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. Or you can also find us on Patreon. Patreon, where you can also uh, make monthly subscriptions to support the podcast. So uh, I hope you'll tune in to our next episode. We are, we're weekly, so you can find a new episode next week. And by the way, if you subscribe, you don't have to think about it. We'll send you a push notification every time a new episode goes live. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.